put under three main categories. This is the first one. Nikaiosumi. You need a new title. Okay? So Jesus says, you have to baptize me so that all righteousness can be fulfilled. So now that all righteousness was fulfilled, what did Jesus say in John 17, 4? I have completed the work that you have sent me to do. All righteousness has been fulfilled. We have a new title. Do you like that? Amen. Does that mean everybody's going to be in heaven? No. It means you have a new title. That's it. But you're no longer under the condemnation of the law. Not because I say so, but because Jesus says so. Amen. John 5, 24. He who believes in me has moved from death to what? Eternal life. Those are his words. I'm just paraphrasing. Verse 11. So that's what righteousness means. Now that Jesus has established righteousness, he can go where? Back to his father. Yeah. And who is going to reveal, reveal now the righteousness? Empirical. Evidence. Visual. His disciples that are now focused on whom? Them going out and doing things? Or letting the Holy Spirit impress them what the agenda for each day is. So that's what righteousness means there. We have to deal with grammar here because, do I need to say this? The Bible was not originally written, Old or New Testament, in the English language. So we need to look up some words to find out why the inspired writer chose a particular word to record the inspired thought that God gave him. When you come across a word in English that you don't understand, what do you do? You go to a dictionary. A dictionary does not give explanations or interpretations. It gives meanings and definitions of a word. Are you with me? No interpretation, no explanations. If you read a language, if you can read, you should get yourself a concordance. That's a Bible dictionary where every word in the Bible is listed. Then you know exactly what God is trying to communicate to you, even though it was originally written in another language other than English. Verse 11, and concerning judgment, because the ruler of this world has been judged. What does that mean? Satan. The ruler of this world has been what? Satan. It shows to be who he is. Yes. What did Jesus say Satan was in John 8, 44? A liar. A murderer. God has been vindicated in Jesus Christ. We're just waiting for us <coughs> to also vindicate, to prove God completely right. <coughs> And concerning judgment, because the ruler of this world has been judged. Who would like to volunteer to read Acts 17, verse 31? Acts chapter 17, verse 31.
Okay, now let's take a look at 13 and John 16, verse 13. But when He, the Spirit of truth, comes, He will guide you into how much truth? All. Oh. Now look at the second part. This is like John 14, 10. This is the Holy Spirit, the one that, by the power of the Holy Spirit, everything was actually created, okay? Remember Genesis chapter 1, verse 2 and 3? Everything was created by the power of the Holy Spirit. God the Father is the master planner. Jesus is the one that makes it happen. Real. But the power of the Holy Spirit is for what? Actually is the power that makes everything happen. It's the power that gives it understanding. Okay? Again, but when He, the Spirit of truth, the Spirit of truth comes, He will guide you into all truth. This is the key. For he will not speak on his own initiative. When did you hear that last? In John 14, 10. Jesus says, I did not open up my mouth. I did not take my own initiative to open up my mouth and say anything. So here we have the Holy Spirit now, not taking his own initiative. There's a lesson here for us. But whatever he hears, he will speak. And he will disclose to you what is to come. Do you like that? Amen. Do you like that God never surprises us? God always tells us what's going to happen before it happens. And then He gives us the power to deal with it. Amen. Do you like that arrangement? Amen. Someday God is going to have a people on this earth that says, Wow. This is the recipe. What have I been doing? Let me read to you the comment in great controversy regarding verse 13. Satan is constantly endeavoring to attract attention to man in the place of God. What did we just read? Satan is using us when we don't focus on the Word of God to develop what? We are his stay of execution. Did we just read in verse 11 of John 16 that Jesus has judged Satan? So when is this going to happen? When God finds a people, then what? I've reached the point that when well-meaning people give me something to read, oh Chuck, you've got to read this. And I said, why? And they, oh, and then they explained to me why. So I said, let me take a look at the book. And I look at the table of contents. And I said, I thank you for thinking of me when you read this book. But at this point in my life, I am so preoccupied with what is inspired. And other literature that I believe is inspired, if I'm talking to an Adventist, I want to watch that this is what I'll do. When I exhaust and master all that is inspired, that is available to me, when I've accomplished that, then I'm going to come to you and say, I'm ready for your book. Amen. <laughs> oh, okay. Or you can give me the book now and I can take it home and I'm going to put it in a box with their other books that I've <laughs> And again, when I've mastered this, and what I've convinced is inspired, then I'll read your book. Oh, okay. They give it to you. It goes in the box. Because you see, what we're talking about here is your soul. Amen. Here we go again. Satan is constantly endeavoring to attract attention to man in the place of God. He leads the people to look at to bishops, to pastors, <laughs> to professors of theology as their guides instead of searching the scriptures to learn their duty for themselves. Then, by controlling the minds of these leaders, he can influence the multitudes according to his will. It was the influence of such teachers that led the Jewish 
nation to reject the Redeemer. Great controversy. 595 and 596. So let's evaluate our situation. For 13 weeks we've been talking about outreach in the community. As far as Jesus is concerned, is the issue that we're facing a lack of works? No. My Bible says in Revelation 3.15, I know your works. So the problem is not a lack of works. According to Jesus. So, let's identify the issue. As I understand it, the issue is that I do not want for the future to be the same as the past. So what changes? Are there, is there anything wrong with the programs that we've been studying for 13 weeks? No. There's absolutely nothing wrong with these programs. So, let's see if this rings a bell for you. The loud cry, what's the loud cry? The first, second, and third angels message proclamation. The loud cry cannot be presented unless the latter rain is first received, which fits God's people to proclaim it. What is the it? The loud cry, the three angels' messages. How long have we been proclaiming the three angels' messages? Since 1840, we began preaching the first angels' message. And then the second angels' message. And what happened? <laughs> 172 years ago, Jesus moved from the first apartment to the second apartment. He closed the door to the first apartment, although Satan is still trying to what? Open, Open it! Because he wants me to focus on what? Us. Who said us? Yes! The it is the first, second, and third angel's message proclaimed by the power of the Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit poured out in an incredible measure through the latter rain. Have you heard of the latter rain? Take a look at your Bibles. Turn to Revelation 18, 1 through 4. People say, oh, wouldn't it be wonderful when other people start joining our church? Would you like to find out why other people have not joined our church? I'm going to read to you because I don't want for you to tar and feather me. <laughs> okay? I didn't write this. I'm just reading it to you. Second chapter, Great Controversy. The title of it is Persecution in the First Centuries. There's another more important question that should be in, that should engage the attention of the churches today. The Apostle Paul declares that all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution, 2 Timothy 3.12. Why is it then that persecution seems in a great degree to slumber? The only reason, not one of several, but the only reason is that the church has conformed to the world standard and therefore awakens no opposition. The religion which is current in our day is not of the pure and holy character that marked the Christian faith in the days of Christ and his apostles. It is only because of the spirit of compromise with sin, because the great truths of the word of God are so indifferently regarded, because there's so little vital godliness in the church that Christianity is apparently so popular with the world. I'm reading. I'm just reading to you. Last sentence. Let there be a revival of the faith and power of the early church and the spirit of persecution will be revived and the fires of persecution will be rekindled. Well, some people say, well, I don't want any part of that. <laughs> Yeah. 
What good would it do God if in the time of trouble he allows the believers that are allowing Jesus to reproduce his character in them to be martyred or serve a useful purpose? This chapter is titled Persecution in the First Centuries. But it begins by what? There is another more important question that should engage the attention of the churches today. So in the time of trouble today, when it comes, God's people, yes, they will be persecuted, but it would make no sense for God to allow them to be mine. The question is, we cannot experience an influx of people in our churches until what is poured out? The latter rain is poured out. Have you heard of the fourth angel? Most people know about the three angels, but they don't know about the fourth angel. Take a look at Revelation chapter 18. Who would like to read verse 4? Four. Verse 4, Revelation 18. And I heard another voice from heaven. There you have it. Saying, Come out of her, my people, that ye be not partakers of her sins, and that ye receive not of her plagues. This is the fourth angel. What does verse 1 say? Of Revelation 18. And after these things I saw another angel come down from heaven having great power and the earth was lightened with his glory. What is that? Is that a physical angel that comes down? Or is God, that God reproducing his character and his blessings through a people that have decided to become not self-dependent but God-dependent? Amen. Time is running out on me, so let me try to wrap things up. So the, if the angel is a symbolic of being a, a great message is going to come? A great message, but through the power of the what? Oh, the good. latter rain. The loud cry of the three angels' messages and the fourth angel cannot be poured out until the latter rain has been poured out. That's what verses 1 through 3 of Revelation 18 is talking about. And then when that happens, what happens in verse 4? Come out of from my people. Who is it talking about? All of the sincere people out there in all of the churches that are looking for what? Evidence to see if this thing called the gospel really works. Amen. They're looking for empirical evidence. That's the only thing that's preventing Jesus from coming back. This gospel of the kingdom must be preached in all the world as a what? As a DVD, a Bible, a piece of literature, a book, a Bible. As a witness. That is a legal term describing a human being that has a pulse and has seen something, heard something, that has changed their heart. The question is, am I receptive to this? That's the, that, that's the issue. So, let's ask some very, very simple questions. Does God the Father want for Jesus to come back? Yes. Does Jesus want to come back? Yes. Does the Holy Spirit want for Jesus to come back? Yes. Careful now. How much do you want for Jesus to come back? That's the issue. That's the question that needs to be asked. Does Satan want for Jesus to come back? No. That's an easy one, too. The tough one is, how much do I want for Jesus to come back? And what are the terms that Scripture tells us will trigger Jesus' second coming? Now that you heard out there or read, what are the biblical terms for Jesus to come back? nights, there's a group of people that get together and are reading a book called Christ in His Sanctuary. Christ in His Sanctuary. Some people say that uh,
Well, let me tell you what some people say. Quote, word for word. A year, 11 months, the 22nd of October, next month, it's been a year when my wife attended a church service, Seventh-day Adventist church service, and the preacher uh, preached on the uh, commemoration of the 171st birthday of the Seventh-day Adventist church. Commemorating. So after the service, my wife says, what do I say to this man as I go out and shake his hand? And she's praying about it. So she, so she decides, this is what she says. I didn't go because I'm tired of hearing evangelical messages on Sabbath. So would you willing to be play a little parable here with me? Okay. You're my wife, and I'm the pastor. And as they're shaking hands, my wife says, when can we expect a sequel to today's message? In other words, when is Jesus coming back, or why hasn't he returned? Here's the pastor's response. Jesus is coming back when he gets good and ready to. And he turns around to shake the next person. Now, what Jenny has said, he understood what we've been studying today. Jesus is coming back when we get good and ready for him to. Amen. When is the siren going to go off? How many minutes? No, no, no. I don't want to. John doesn't ever get here until 42. I'm telling you, you got it. How many times? 10.42. John's not here yet. Gets on in yet. We have two minutes and 30 seconds. Let me wrap this up. Because Janet doesn't want to ring in. The statement is. Jesus' ministry in the most holy place is the connecting link, the connecting link, the connecting link between you as an individual and where Jesus is at and what he's doing. The connecting link. Some people say that it's inevitable that everybody's going to die. The Bible doesn't teach that. In 1 Corinthians 15, 51, we're told that we shall not all die. In 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 through 18, we're told that there will be people alive when Jesus comes. And that is what God impressed me this morning when I awakened about the word urgency. Yes, we should be active. But it is urgent on how active we are. We should be active in a very, very urgent way. Why? Because Jesus cannot come back until he has a people that he can do all of these things that we've been studying about this morning. The outpouring of the latter rain. That can only happen through a people that have decided to connect directly with where Jesus is at and what he's doing. Amen. Some people say that there is no delay. The Sabbath School Quarterly for the fourth quarter of 2002, the topic was hope and the delay part two. The previous week it was the hope and the delay part one. At the bottom of the Sabbath comments, Sabbath, November 30, 2002, this is what it said. Delay is a term that comes from only the human perspective. Time has continued longer than we human, than we human beings perceive. But not according to God. So, according to some of the people, that put the Sabbath school order together back in 2002, the last quarter. There is no delay. Let me read to you the title of a little book. It's a compilation called Evangelism. The title of the chapter is The Reason for the Delay. That's 
I know that if the people of God had preserved a living connection, what did I just read to you when we were studying on Tuesday night? Christ in the sanctuary. The ministry, His ministry in the second apartment is the connecting link for us. The connecting link. I know that if the people of God had preserved a living connection with Him, if they had obeyed him, His word, they would today be in the heavenly kingdom. Written, March 30, 1903, General Conference. So, how long do you want to stay here? That's your choice and mine. All of heaven wants for Jesus to come back. You say that you want for Jesus to come back. The question is, how much? How much do we want for Jesus to come back? And until we make that choice, he cannot come back. God bless you. Amen. That one's looking nice. Nice massage.